Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 813. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is July 28th, 2023. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. This is our happy place. This is where George and I sit down and find our webcams and talk about the news around the world. And you get to watch us do that. And for some reason, you like to do that. We appreciate that. Therefore, I ask you as humble viewers, would you please click the like button on Facebook or YouTube? I noticed that 30% of my audience, according to Google, are not subscribed yet. You need to subscribe. You want your news instantly from Kevin and George? Click that red rectangle right there. Click that bell, and you will get instant notifications if everything works properly. I understand two or three of you aren't getting notifications from YouTube. I will look into that, but the the uh, other 8,000 are doing just fine. George, how are you doing this week? Wonderful. I had a meeting, my first one-on-one -on -one with the bishop, uh, uh, Justin Holcomb, on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. We were scheduled for 45 minutes. Uh, he gave me two hours. Nice. And that just, it's the best, bishop, best meeting I've ever had with the bishop in 30 years doing this. Uh, new bishop, he's 10 years younger than I am, uh, but he has a beard that's turned gray, so he looks old. I think he did that on purpose. But he said some stuff that just, just overjoyed my heart. Mm -hmm. Uh in talking about the practical administrative sides of things of being a bishop he said he th he thought his job was to get out of the way of successful churches and rectors and invest in the growth that we're experiencing rather than trying to prop up the dead wood we've got missions that are receiving aid for over 100 years now mm. and you know 50,000 to a church with 40 people with a halftime rector that 25 years ago had 40 people with a halftime rector yeah, you know that fifty thousand redeployed to a parish that needs a youth minister. What would that return? Um, so here, here's somebody who is looking not to advance agendas of, you know, racial solidarity or this or that. No hobby horses other than church growth, evangelism, and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And he wants to gather the rectors whose churches are doing well to meet with them informally as a group to sort of, you know, discuss what's working, what's not working. And so I mustered up my courage and I gave him my ask list. I want a curate. I want another deacon. I want the money to build an education building. And the answers to all of them were yes. Uh, they'll pay for half. If I can pay half, they'll pay half for a curate. Nice. Uh, if, uh, if I got the plans and can show a business plan where I can pay off a building for 30 years, they'll find the money at no interest or super low interest. Um, my plan is to start a, an elementary preschool, uh, 80 children below the age of five. And for that, I need a purpose-built building and I can put a second floor on it with offices. Uh, and if I can pay that off over 30 years, the diocese will step in and help me do it. Uh, I'm like floored because all the, my, see, I've got 11, 12 years before they can legally kick me out. I've got, I've got tenure, I've got freehold, whatever you want to call it. And Bishop, and I mentioned that and the Bishop said, well, if you're of sound mind and body, you can continue past that with no problem. I've seen how so, they've overlooked the sound mind and body thing uh, many times in the Episcopal church. So you're, well, you're good forever. <laughs> well, Here's the thing is I've I've let's just do it in round numbers. I've got a ten I've got a ten year plan now that I can work on. Mm -hmm. And I and I know that they're resources. And uh and he told me that the reason why he was saying this was because I showed a track record of eight years of uninterrupted growth. We doubled in seven years, took a hit at COVID, but we're now roughly back to where we were before. So I've got now a bishop who's interested in church growth, who's interested in pastoral care of their clergy, who's not basically saying, this is what you're going to do, and this is the only way we're going to do stuff. I want to start a mission in the neighboring town of Homosassa. He said, fine, maybe we can do that, and the person you get as a curate, after three years, you can set, uh, loosen him on the people of Homosassa. 
grow right. it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, part of your growth work can be renting the women's club down there so you don't have any fixed costs other than personnel. You've got somebody that you're training and then they can take it on after three, four years. I've never had a bishop talk to me like this before. Wow. It's always uh, doom and gloom and, you know, or no talk whatsoever. Yeah. No, it's, you know, circle the wagons. It's, uh, you know, we don't want to uh, uh, offend anybody in the uh, 815 offices, that type of thing. No, I, I agree that uh, this is going to be a, a new day, a new page, uh, a new journey for the Diocese of Central Florida. We'll have to see how that turns out. Well, we, I think oh, okay. I, yeah. I would also mention that the, the intention and the desire to keep Central Florida as Fortress Florida is going to continue. Mm -hmm. We're not going to see any softening uh, or change to accommodate whatever fancies come down the pike uh, from the north, which is very encouraging. Well, I mean, if we're talking about Florida bishops right now, why don't I also skip to uh, story seven and we'll talk about Charlie Holt? Because there's a, a contrast here. Um, mm -hmm. The Diocese of Central Florida had no problem voting in and getting approval for uh, your bishop. Uh, Who is probably it's, more conservative on paper than Charlie Holt. It sailed through. Uh, Charlie Holt um, had some people in, in the diocese he wanted to be a bishop in uh, really work overtime to make sure that that didn't happen. And guess what? It didn't happen. We learned this week that Charlie Holt was refused by uh, presiding bishop Michael Curry, uh, the leading role in the Diocese of Florida. Mm -hmm. And we had sort of predicted this. We, a few weeks ago, we talked about how the Diocese of Spokane in Washington State had reversed its no vote to a yes vote. And at the time, we were saying that if a middle-of-the-road diocese like Spokane was, had voted no originally, that's a bad sign. And unfortunately, that has panned out. Within the Diocese of Florida, there was a small group, a very small group, and it's never been more than 10% of the churches and people, who are opposed to the old bishop's refusal to allow gay clergy, partnered gay clergy, into the diocese. And they teamed up with uh, a rather activist uh, Union of Black Episcopalians group who uh, said the bishop wasn't paying enough attention to racial needs and wasn't involved in critical race theory and everything. And these people basically tried every legal trick, every legal skullduggery. They had the first, first election thrown out, second election, Holt won on the first ballot uh, with the two-thirds majorities, two-thirds plus one. And having been unable to defeat him at the ballot box or through legal chicanery, they started a letter writing campaign and accused Holt of uh, being racist, homophobic, all this and that. Now Holt responded by trying to reach out and form an accommodation and say, you know, I'll respect your viewpoints and this or that. And it didn't do any good. You know, when you try to appease the these people they just go even further and at the end of the day Holt lost now the difference between Florida and Central Florida is that Central Florida doesn't have a small minority of cons of liberals we have mm -hmm. one uh, and and that and she's a very nice person uh, second uh, Sam Howard is actively disliked the former bishop the, the outgoing bishop of Florida we he could would, say he made enemies as a bishop, you know, within the diocese. Howard made enemies early on with the people like Neil Labar and the conservatives mm -hmm. in the diocese of Florida, mm -hmm. who he pushed out. And then he made enemies of the liberals of diocese of Florida, mm -hmm. whom he kicked out. And the only people left were people who kept their head down and the, and the small group who basically were able to escape his notice. And Howard was genuinely unpopular. Howard never left Jacksonville. If you were in Lake City or uh, Williston, uh, these are places people outside of Florida will never have heard never of. Hear if, you were out, <laughs> if you were out in the George equivalent in Florida, sure, you know, yeah. thirty miles across the county line in Levy County, Hooterville or, uh, is what we call it. Yes. Hooterville. 
<laughs> Never saw Howard once. He'd no. send uh, Bishop Kaiser, retired assistant bishop, to do all that stuff. Howard never mm -hmm. left Jacksonville. He couldn't be bothered. And uh, he just was, he just made mistakes in people. And so when he came hard down on the side of Charlie Holt, that just was like almost a negative influence. So at the end of the day, Charlie Holt is, is vetoed. But here's the thing, you cannot say it's because he was conservative, because then how do you explain what happened in Central Florida? Well, no, hold on, we, we can explain it by a powerful minority. Okay, in the Diocese of Florida, they have a minority who's learned to be the majority, to be mm -hmm. louder than the majority, and that got the attention of 815, that got the attention of all the other dioceses. By being that loud and complaining, uh, it worked against Mark Lawrence. Uh, they were able to have a second election for him. Why not try it in Florida? Uh, Mark Lawrence was able, able to overcome it. Uh, in the uh, era of Catherine Jefferts Shorey, uh, Charlie Holt was not. If, analogies are always hard to do, but in many ways, Central Florida is more akin to uh, was more akin to the old Fort Worth, which you know had a very very small proportion sure. of liberals, yeah. and even then their liberals were not that liberal. Uh, they just didn't like Jack Eicher. Um, our uh, maybe the old bishops hands off out of sight out of mind policies sort of prevented the uh, heat that uh, we see in florida but i guess we're sort of uh maybe uh, it's not nice to say but i'm speculating that maybe uh the episcopal church is allowing central florida to be this oddball so that they can show the wider anglican communion no we're not mean gr money grubbing buildings building snatching people look we let the we let george conger be the kook that he is and you know bishop holcomb could, you know, we I, I went to an ordination last night uh in ocala the ordination of a deacon transitional deacon he's going to be priest six months to a year a conservative white heterosexual man with his wife and children at the ordination uh, Come on now, you can't find that in the Diocese of Washington. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, in other words, we've got another, we have good clergy coming up the pike here in Central Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just, uh, maybe we've just escaped notice and nobody watches our show in New York oh, City. And so too, therefore. It's too hot to send uh, naysayers down to Florida. That may be it. You know, nobody wants to sit there year round uh, in order to be the, the, liberal in a diocese who knows um for whatever reason there is one stable diocese in the episcopal church you know well and, i think uh, dallas is stable but i i don't know I, you know I'm, I'm hearing more and more stuff it's stable for now but somebody is taking a hatchet to the foundation yeah and uh you happen to be in the one diocese that is stable and congratulations on that uh, let's move on to the world of Anglican news. Um, and here's a, the, the most remarkable story this week was that a ACNA parish left for the Episcopal Church, a CFO, uh, CSFO parish uh, under Todd Hunter uh, said, hey, we're out of here. We're going to go to the Episcopal Church. And nobody caught it. Nobody except Kevin, your host. Kevin noticed that you can leave the ACNA without a lawyer, without a lawsuit, without going to the Supreme Court, without begging for your property. You can just get up and call your bishop and say, hey, we're moving over to, over to the Episcopal Church. Nothing happened in the courts, George. Nothing. No. Uh, Resurrection South Austin mm -hmm. is the name of the parish, and it's led by a priest named Sean mccain Therese. And I don't know whether that's a hyphenated last name or he just spells all three out. So I'll, I'll just call him Therese. So I apologize if I've misnamed him. Uh, you would not be the first. Therese, Therese uh, is one of these people on the what I would call the Canterbury Trail, an evangelical who was a stranger to the whole Episcopal Wars who came in to the ACNA through the C4SO because he was sort of a non-denominational guy, you know, the skinny jeans and a plaid shirt, 
uh, mm -hmm. types with expensive sneakers uh, who wanted to have liturgy and wanted to have function and structure. Well, he got the externals, but he also brought with him some of the detritus of popular culture. And Therese, for the last few years, has been prominent on Twitter, Anglican Twitter, uh, putting out critical race theory stuff. Um, and after having drunk that Kool-Aid, he's recently drunk the gay marriage Kool-Aid. And if you look on uh, Facebook and other social media platforms, members of his congregation say for the past few months, Therese has been working on the congregation, telling them why he disagrees with the ACNA's stance on uh, homosexuality on, and on women. And he also raised the specter of women, that there were some dioceses that didn't allow women clergy, while his diocese did. And so they had a congregational vote and some 80% of the people who are attracted to this sort of post-millennial, post-denominational Anglicanism said, yeah, you know, the Episcopal Church may seem a better fit for us. So that this is the third Acne Parish to leave, the second to join the Episcopal Church. At St. Mary of Bethany uh, in Nashville left and is now non-denominational. Right. The table which is a C4SO parish in Indianapolis, has joined the Diocese of Indianapolis Episcopal. Mm -hmm. And now this is joining the Diocese of Texas, Res Resurrection South Austin. Well, what's, what's concerning to me is I have not seen a press release from Todd Hunter or his diocese about this. Were they caught blindsided? Mm -hmm. Did this happen in the dark of night? Uh, or was there some planning and involvement with Todd Hunter? Because uh, he was semi-involved in the, when the, the, the table moved. I, I'm speculating here because no, we've I've not seen anything from Todd Hunter or from the diocese. But you know, yes, the the gay stuff is the stuff that everybody notices first of all. But what Therese has really been pounding over the years has been the critical race theory, mm -hmm. and that's the issue that when Todd Hunter was in the, when the bishops of the ACNA met in private, they both basically said, "Hey, hey, hey, you cut know, pull back yeah. a bit, yeah. cut it out." And if this was the guy's hobby horse and his bishop who was allowing him to run with this is sort of talked off the edge, he's basically going to take up the, uh, uh, up the banner. But for me, the issue is how come nobody in authority, you know, wasn't able to sort of catch this in the sense of this is a failure of teaching. In other words, you have a priest who has poor doctrine and he's just allowed to run with this poor doctrine without without uh, oversight or involvement i'm not saying he needed to be re-educated but he needed to be engaged to point sure. out that what you are what you're promoting is contrary to the doctrine and discipline of this denomination why is it that you're you know do you not understand what we believe and instead, he's basically allowed to do his own thing. Now, some people are celebrating, yay, we get rid of all the kooks. But I never, I always think the dialogue and conversation is always the best policy. Um, now, that could have happened, and we just don't know about it. Very we're, true. We're, we're spec we are speculating here. And, you no, know, I agree with you in that respect also. But in some respect, I expect uh, a little bit of accountability before this happened. And having heard none, you know, I, I don't want to speculate any further about that. Uh, it's interesting. And let's do the math because some people are saying the sky is falling. This is all over for the ACNA. What's what's one in a hundred? That's one percent. What's one in a thousand? One tenth of one percent. <laughs> I don't think the sky is falling. I don't think the ACNA is falling apart because well, of one. If there are 125,000 active members of the ACNA and they're going to lose 80 people, in South Austin, yeah. I don't think it's the end of the world. I don't think so either. I think the AC is strong, and um, I go to a, you know, attend a church plant in Tampa, uh, and it's doing very well. So, and let's... the other thing, we also need to remember Austin, Texas is Texas is Madison, Wisconsin. It it's is. The it's loony the, land. <laughs> it's very loony. Um, 
it used to have some strong evangelical churches, though. I remember some of the mega churches that were in Austin. Uh, I know a rector from one, and it's changed quite a bit over the last 20 or 30 years. On to some more news. Let's do some international news. Former Archbishop of York, John Samtanu, has been refused to officiate in the diocese, I forget the diocese, by Helen Ann Hartley due to his refusal to repent. Lots of refusals going on there, George. If you remember in March, John Samtanu was not allowed to have a license in the diocese of Newcastle, which is the northernmost diocese in England along the Scottish border. Uh on the east coast of England. And because of his uh, role in the Trevor de Van Menekan controversy. <laughs> yeah, I think you got it. You got it. <laughs> Tre- Trevor was a, uh, a Church of England priest who raped uh, a boy, who later became a Church of England priest. And when, he, the, the, uh, when the boy became a man and reported this uh, to his bishop, Stephen Croft, at the time, Croft did nothing. And when Sintamo was informed, Sintamo did nothing. Uh, a study was, uh, an investigation was done, and it found that Sintamo had not lived by the spirit of the safeguarding agreement. Sintamo vigorously rejected this suggestion, saying he did what he was supposed to do, and he just did no more. Well, this, what's today, Thursday? On Wednesday, Helen Ann Hartley said, put out a statement saying she had met with John Sintamo and she was refusing to give him a permission to officiate in the diocese. Uh, beforehand, it was just a pause until this thing settled out. But now the answer is no, because Sintamo continues to say he did nothing wrong and has nothing to apologize for. But Helen Ann Hartley is saying that if he's thinking that, then he just doesn't get it. Under investigation uh, years ago, did not he have a flood in his basement that destroyed the records? Uh, of this person? Well, there's some other things. Every it's, time, you know, St. Tom, oh, well, the flood of 97, or I don't know what yeah, when know. it was. <laughs> but there's a flood that uh, soaked the records room in England. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing that St. Tom has refused permission to officiate, and he is the, if you will, accomplice, while the, the actual perpetrator, Stephen Croft, remains Bishop of Oxford. Mm-hmm. And Justin Welby has done nothing. So what does this tell us? That uh, is all of a sudden John Santamu unpopular? Or is Welby just not give a damn, excuse my language, about safeguarding? Yeah. Well, I mean, the evidence didn't... Oh, I can't even speak. The evidence is that Justin Welby and the Church of England don't give a damn. Safeguarding was something that was going to be their virtual signaling. Look at us. We have a safeguarding board. We, we're, they're doing wonderful investigation. They're turning up names. Oops, they turned up my name. <laughs> we don't need no board. <laughs> and so, yeah, you are right. They, they've completely... Uh, let, me just, yeah. Yeah. let me just mention one thing. They've now they've started all over again again, the Church of England. They've asked Alexis J., uh, who was the head of the independent inquiry into organizationals the the big government investigation of all the churches okay and institutions into sexual abuse she's been asked to look at into the church of england's particular issue and she's put out a statement saying that if they interfere with me just once i'm out of here so welby has uh, basically restarted the whole process with somebody who has pretty good credentials in this field but you know it's one thing to hire a new person to look at problems. It's another thing to allow bishops who basically have dirty hands to continue in office. Hmm. Oh, well, let's finish up our story in Church of England. Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, put out a little press release saying, it's been one year since Lambeth, and we're, there's no looking back. We're so strong, and um, all the Zoom meetings are working, and... Uh, the, the, nothing happened at Lambeth that was not good. Huh. I mean, That's not what I all remember. I, <laughs> all they needed was, you know, for background music, the, the song from Hair, Good yeah, Morning right. Starshine, <laughs> the Earth Says Hello, <laughs> You Twinkle Above Us, We Sparkle Below. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, the living in La La Land about 
how productive the church is with all these Zoom meetings and all these committee meetings and all this busy work, pointless busy work, shows the church of God in action. Yeah. Well, if he thinks that's the church that Christ built, no, I, I don't agree with him. He's, but what's I think more telling is that people are criticizing the GAFCON and the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans for not filling the void of Welby. Welby's got the money to continue doing this pointless busy work and filling up press releases and committee meetings and joint meetings and oh we'll have all these people travel here first class junket and this and that well what's the counter move by global south and gafcon yeah uh, is it a timing thing uh we know that uh will be called together a primates meeting again for next year and is the global south and gafcon waiting for them to really present themselves as leadership or are we just having this one year vacuum because uh, GAFCON talks a good game, but they just don't have the ability to step in and be the leadership for the Anglican Communion or the Global South. There's kind of a dispute between them as to how we go forward. And at GAFCON 3, 4, 3, 4, we learned that uh, GAFCON wants to take on a different journey. They're going to be more the evangelical breed uh, of uh this movement the global south is going to be more of the we're going to take on the justin Welby, and so have they not worked that mix out or is it timing well and you know the the head of the global south justin body arama is the archbishop of south sudan mm -hmm. and that's good it's perennial basket case in terms of uh, poverty uh Politics, floods yeah. famine civil war mm -hmm. so he's got a lot on his plate anyway yeah um so we, but there is a vacuum, and uh, who's and Welby's trying to fill it. But here's the thing: this announcement of one year message on from Lambeth. I got to tell you, Kevin, uh, my reports on Mex on Indian corruption get four to five times <laughs> the viewership than Justin Welby's. You know, nobody cares, or at least none of our viewers care about. I out of duty, I post this stuff from Welby, but nobody reads it or watches it. And I think the same is happening in the Church of England, uh, or at least the UK. Out of duty, they say, yeah, he's still the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, but nobody really recognizes him as that leadership role, but nobody else has stood up. Nobody has said, mm -hmm. hey, we're, we're now leading the communion, and this is our trajectory forward. Justin Welby says, the trajectory forward is meetings and Zoom meetings. Okay, well, let's go with that, Justin. All right, let's move on to some more. I got two fun stories here. Uh, Living Church, uh, kind of a not a competitor, but another news producer in the Christian world, uh, Anglican world, has hired Matthew Over as the new director. I don't know him, George. He is a professor at Neshota House. Okay. Um, I. I'll state it personally. I worked for the Living Church under its sure. former editor, David Calvillage, mm -hmm. and I assisted Steve Waring, its news director. And I think it was 2009 or was it 2012? One of those years. Uh, when David Calvillage well, retired. I, I need to make a... Uh, I'm biased too because I used to be a contractor for Living Church. I was doing some website stuff for them, so... You know, understand that we are, you know, fans of and friends of Living Church. Living Church had always been the Anglo-Catholic publication mm -hmm. and basically was the opposition paper in the in the Episcopal Church uh, against Episcopal News Service. Mm -hmm. And when Cavalich retired, they brought on a new editor who wanted to make peace with the Episcopal Church. And, you know, Steve Waring and I would do these stories about, you know, venison and corruption and you know we, we we did the news and it wasn't good and the living church didn't want that anymore they uh they fired steve and they just stopped uh giving me con you know i was freelance they stopped giving weekly freelance for nine years they stopped giving me work and they took it in a different direction and they basically took it into a liberal middle of the road direction and into an affirming Catholicism 
mindset. Mm -hmm. And also into a celebration of geekdom, the uh, Anglican geekdom. Well, the director uh, got kicked upstairs. Uh, he, he is being a significant paid off and he got hired by Welby to head some commission, the inner Anglican commission on faith, order and unity or whatever. Okay, it is. Yeah, yeah. And now the board of the living church foundation has hired a new, his title is a uh, uh, publisher and executive director. Oliver is an Anglo Catholic who teaches at Neshota house. He'll still teach at Neshota house. And he'll uh, basically, I'm hopeful that he will return it to its traditional vigorous Anglo Catholic roots as opposed to its uh, geeky, uh, uh, being unkind. Well, um, I, yeah, I think you're being a little bit unkind because they do have a, a, a good following. They are able to raise money and, and self publish through that. Uh, they also have a good mm -hmm. forum that people go, well, people go to this forum and, and they have inherited, the they have inherited money. Oh, they have, okay. They have a foundation that pays the bills. If it weren't for the foundation, they don't, they're not a profitable entity. Okay. Uh, like they, us. <laughs> well, we, uh, well, it appeals to a certain type sure. of Anglican. Yep. Agreed. But, but we'll see which way Olver takes this new takes it in the new direction. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go back here to show notes. See, the trick for Olver will be yeah. the trick Neshota House has to negotiate of being a seminary both for the Episcopal Church and the ACNA. Right now, the Living Church is basically only for the Episcopal Church. It really yeah. doesn't have an ACNA following. And Olver has Olver can keep this alive by appealing to that segment of the Anglo-Catholic community that has left the Episcopal Church. And he may be able to do that because he's from as a professor of Neshota House, which appeals both to the Episcopal Church and to the ACNA. So mm -hmm. this may be a good future for the Living Church. We'll have to see how that turns out. Uh, you mentioned an organization that I've never heard of. Uh, called Taz, Tazzy, Tozzy, Taze. 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 I have it. Okay, Taz. Yep, it's Taze. You could use that. I didn't have the apostrophe over the e. New head of Taze is an Anglican. Oh, that's not right. I thought he's going to be Roman Catholic. Yeah, well, uh, Brother Alwa, a German Catholic, has stepped mm -hmm. down, and the new uh, uh, prior of the Taze movement is a member of the Church of England, who's called Brother William. He's been there since 86. It's a, based in France, and it's a very popular uh, ecumenical uh, faith movement. There's a particular worship. My church will have Taze services three, four times a year with candles yeah, they, and darkness okay. and singing. I've, and, I've been in, in the circles for many years. If I don't know, probably 50% of the audience doesn't know. So Taze is a movement. And, and the other 50 <laughs> probably are just love it or hate it because of <laughs> yes. his experience. But the... Uh, is it like happening uh, or Vokari or what's it, you know? No, it's uh, very, it, it's a Catholic ethos. Okay. Uh, and, it you know, singing of chanting and hymns and this, that. Um, but this is big news. Like the Vatican press went, put out a thing saying Anglican... <laughs> head of the Taze movement, which is like uh, like having, uh, I don't know, a Buddhist in charge of the church pension fund. You know, hey, wait a second, that shouldn't be. So I think it's interesting that Taze really is ecumenical and that they didn't, it never had a non-Roman Catholic leader before. So there you go. Well, there you go. We get to talk about Pope Francis. Uh, it's, we're 33 minutes into the show. We could spend 20 minutes talking about Pope Francis, and nobody would bat an eye. Um, you and I were kind of a fan early on. Oh, boy, somebody from South America has been elected a uh, pope, and uh, this could only be a good thing. And as we've watched, this only could be a good thing. Has really uh, ruffled some feathers in Rome and around the world and left you and I scratching our head. What is he doing? He's an Anglican wannabe. He doesn't want to be Roman Catholic. And he's then an wannabe, Kevin. he's an Episcopal wannabe. He's an Episcopal. Now he's no. Now he's an Episcopal wannabe, and uh, it's hard to tell uh, what he's doing because one month he is on message, 
And I don't know if it's just because a press release was put out in his name. And one month after he's done an interview with an atheist or something, uh, the whole church is upside down. And we are in the upside down church moment, George. What's happening? Well, I think in March, didn't he say something about he denounced the transgender movement? And gender- uh, yeah, and March 11th, I have an article here. Pope Francis spoke out against gender theory in a recent interview, echoing his past comments expressing disapproval of transgendered ideology. Ideology. <laughs> Ideology. And you okay, or so he, idolatry, one of the other <laughs> idolatry. And so he's on point. You know, my gosh, in March he was on point. This week a little different. We he did an interview uh with a transgender person and says, God loves us as we are. Now, if you take that in circumstance that God accepts you as you are, and will start with you as you are, of course. God loves everyone. If you take that as a transgendered person took it to say, hey, he, he accepts me as a transgender person and I, I fulfilled this journey being transgendered and God loves me because I fulfilled this journey as a transgender person, we've, we've lost narrative here, George. Yeah, and his appointments, uh, I think they appointed 18 yep. or 22 cardinals or 18 cardinals. Maybe it's 18 who can vote out of the 22 because they're under 70 whatever the number is that uh, a dozen or two cardinals many of them are a number of them are from the uh, from the liberal progressive side um in other words you have somebody a white guy from south africa from cape town who is sort of in the cardinal casper mold uh so you have oh we have another african maybe it'll be like cardinal sarah no you've got a white south african liberal um but the biggest thing is his head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the old Holy Office, which basically sets the doctrinal parameters. Pope Benedict, when he was a cardinal, was the head of this office. Gerhard Mueller was most recently. And now that Benedict is dead, Francis has gone all the way to repudiate all Benedict's people, uh, policies stances well it, uh, Francis, that's true that's true because benedict had people he called heretics pope francis employs them mm-hmm. well the, they've been put victor manuel fernandez they call him tuco or tucho uh but a bishop from argentina he's been made a cardinal and he's been put in charge of the uh holy office and when uh Fernandez was a regular old bishop. Some of his writings, Gerhard Buhler at the time, the head of the Holy Office, said were heresy. Now, the guy who was writing heretical writings 10, 15 years ago is now in charge of policing church doctrine. And the cover letter that Francis gave to Fernandez was basically just saying, we have to move past the old intolerant, yeah. immoral, rigid rigidity that uh, was... Uh, in the past, meaning my predecessor was an old stick in the mud and his people were too traditional. Um, So we've we've got, and Fernandez is uh, open to gay marriage, he's open to women priests, he's open to all the sort of Episcopal critical race theory, all this stuff that the Episcopal church and its kookiness is known for, that Francis people suspect he's going for. Well, this is the guy, this, he's now, Francis has now set the machine up to produce the results that gave you the Episcopal Church, but in Catholic clothing. Yep. Well, one know. of the things I, just in reading some of the comments, um, in the past, uh, if you, you know, biblical prophecy and the Antichrist and Revelation, that was always the preserve of a certain type of Protestant. In other words, uh, Saddam, Saddam Hussein is the beast of Babylon. Absolutely. I mean, I remember when the call for, I remember when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And I was in, I was in Alabama at the time and listening to AM radio, every AM radio preacher said, this is the end times. Saddam Hussein is the Antichrist. And open book of Revelation and Daniel, we're going through it. <laughs> I'm like, what? Well, and 
Catholics would scoff and say, well, of course, we have our traditions than the magisterium, which will prevent any of this from happening. Well, recently in the Catholic press, I'm seeing a biblical term I saw thrown around back in the good old days of Pat Robertson. And that's the word, that's the Greek word kataton. And that's from mm -hmm. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. And in that letter, Paul writes, Christians was not behave as if the day of the Lord was happening tomorrow, since the son of perdition, meaning the Antichrist of first and second John, had not must be revealed beforehand. And before the Antichrist is revealed, there's the catechon, who's someone who restrains him, who stands in the way, blocks the triumph of the Antichrist. And now I'm reading in Catholic articles that were sober and full of tradition and this and that, references to Second Thessalonians and that Benedict was the catechon. Benedict was the thing that was blocking the onset of the Antichrist. Benedict was going to preserve us from the rise of uh, Satan, of the of the beast. And so now we're seeing sort of a weird, I don't want to say weird, but we're seeing a weird where the Pentecostals and the conservative Catholics are coming together, both reading very closely Second Thessalonians. And I have to say, I have some sympathy because Benedict did hold the line and Francis seems to be going crazy. You know, if you look back at the last 1500 years of popes, you know, you could say there's been a lot of popes who've, you know, obscured what it means to be a pope, obscured the doctrine, especially obscured the uh, the dogma. Uh, so I, I don't want to throw this all on Francis's uh, feet because uh, in the interview he did on March 11th, he was very clear that gender confusion is is destroying our society by well-intentioned people. He knows on paper <laughs> in a good interview, but you know, you get him free th th throwing in a, a videotaped interview or radio interview, he'll say anything, George. And that is a problem. I'll like to say, I'd like to go down a tiny rabbit hole okay. because we will have com uh, people on our, on the YouTube comment section, bring up, bring up, well, what about Henry the eighth, uh, a murderous, sure. adulterous, this, that, and the other. And that that could never happen in the Catholic Church. And I say, well, remember Napoleon and Josephine. Oh, wow. 1810, yeah. Napoleon divorced Josephine at, to marry Marie of Austria because Josephine could no longer have children. She couldn't have children. And the Catholic Church said, yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. Because Napoleon said with his army in Italy around the Vatican, if you don't do it, we'll do what the Church of England did. And the Vatican, because the army was there, said, yeah, you can divorce the uh, Josephine and marry Marie of Austria. And the excuse for allowing this was, oh, well, she lied on her marriage certificate. She said she was a certain age and she was actually older. She wanted to appear younger. And so that was grounds for a... a Dis dissolving a marriage after all those years. Well, when Napoleon was defeated, what happened? The Vatican changed his mind and said, no, that marriage wasn't, and you're not allowed to have gotten divorced. It's because an army was missing from Italy that uh, the Pope was afraid of. Mm -hmm. So having, so if you want to throw stones at Henry VIII, just think of Napoleon and Josephine. But Every the, denomination uh, has its ills. Anglicanism, Roman Catholicism, Eastern and Western Orthodox, they all, come on, Methodism, which has completely collapsed in the last year. Um, but, you know, Kevin, that there really is something in the air uh, that is causing people um, of all stripes to say the situations can't continue the way it is, whether it's in the church or in the political world or the social world, or the economic world. I'm sensing a great deal of unease that I think we're in some sort of transitional phase in world history. I don't want to sound kooky or anything, but just like you know, in recovery from COVID, I, when I presented my numbers to the bishop, one of the things I pointed out was that I'm having to work harder to attract the number of people that I did in the past 
it took less effort in the past than it does today because people are not really interested in getting off their couch on Sunday mornings. Or if I had somebody come in four times a month before, now they're coming three times. And if they came three times, two times, and so on and so forth. But I see it in, uh, in our political world with this upset with both the Democrats and the Republicans in the international world where, and in the medical, just there's a movement of foot of unease and fearfulness that I'm having a difficult time quantifying and qualifying. Yeah, we've reached a point in history where it's unattainable. Mm -hmm. We can't stay like this. We as a people, uh, as a species, as uh, uh, created by God, uh, are completely separated by politics. Politics separates us more than anything. It separates us more than uh, our countries it separates us more than our religion it separates us more than um uh anything i can see in the past history i know i got a cat going back behind me interrupting the show get out of there there's a cat war happening in in the couch uh behind me right now and i'm sorry if it interrupted the show but we live now in an untenable situation and in a temple an unattainable time in history we can't stay like this something has to happen uh, and it has to happen at a God level, at mm-hmm. a miracle level, where we find something that can unite us again. Uh, the United States has never been this ununited except the Civil War. Um, you watch uh, uh, any news channel, uh, it's, they've all been liberalized. There is no uh, two sides of every story. Uh, you watch any uh, uh, church service, and they become, uh, sadly, political. Uh, it, it's hard to watch. So how do we get beyond an untenable time in history, George? That's the question. Well, I don't know the answers, but I do know that what our leaders are doing isn't working. Right. Justin, Justin Welby's Zoom conferences and that stuff has been just rejected by the wider church. And some, I think there's just people are waiting for something to come along um i don't know i don't know either uh, here in america we have uh, upcoming presidential election uh, and we've entered the, the season of absolute chaos uh they indicted trump again uh after uh joe biden's son hunter lost in court the other day a day later they said well we're going for trump <laughs> it's just you, you watch this in chaos and for me a person travels the kind of the red states here uh, people are really upset by this. And, you know, I don't like Trump. I've been very vocal about that. But I don't think he would have too much trouble being reelected, even indicted in, in, in this current uh, uh, criminal state, so to speak. You know? Crazy. All right, George. I think let's, let me double check the stories. You got any, any encryption stories we need to cover? Well, the, uh, the newer item. Oh, we did do Spong. Uh, Spong is not dead yet. <laughs> this is my headline. Uh, Spong, former uh, bishop of New Jersey, Newark? Newark. Newark, yep. Newark. It's all the same there, George. I've driven through. <laughs> it's all the same. Uh, bishop Spong uh, is held to roost again uh, because of a decision he made a long time ago. When Spong was bishop, he bought the Archdiocese of Newark, the Catholics' Archdiocese's yeah. old headquarters which is a box office building in downtown Newark. And the thinking at the time was that the message of, uh, you know, his new theses for a new generation and his popularity on Bill Maher's uh, talk show was that the liberal gates were going to open and the Episcopal Church would just be awash with new converts that he, we were going to catch the wave, and Jack Spong was the, one of the big stars in the firmament, and we needed big office spaces and buildings to house committees and classes and this and that. So they bought an ugly box in downtown Newark. Well, Spong passes from the scene, and the next two bishops figure out quite quickly that the trajectory straight down in membership and attendance and income that Spong initiated wasn't slowing. 
and they had a white elephant of an ugly box building in Newark. And renting commercial space in downtown Newark is hard. It's not a. It's not my before Miami COVID. Beach. Before COVID, yeah. Before COVID, it was hard, and now it's even harder. Mm -hmm. And for years, they've been trying to get rid of this white elephant. Well, the New Jersey Arts Council, I think it is, uh, got one hundred and fifty million dollars to redevelop a portion of Newark, and they wanted to buy the building and knock it down to build an opera house or auditorium or something. And the diocese said, yes, please. <laughs> and they got three and a half million bucks and they're going to move to a redundant church in Livingston, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, has plenty of parking. It's uh, conveniently located both on the parkway and the turnpike for our New Jersey viewers. Mm -hmm. And it's basically more uh, amenable to the work of a diocesan office because it's already got a chapel, the church and everything. But the, the, but so finally, now we're th the third bishop post Spong, and she's finally been able to unload one of Spong's financial out white elephants. And basic, and they're just lucky that the state of New Jersey wanted to redevelop a blighted downtown. No, I, absolutely. Uh, I, I had hoped after Spong died, we wouldn't have to do any reporting of his stuff, but you know, I'm glad they were able to Zion size, get some money for it. And uh, uh, same happened in the Diocese of Connecticut. They had this huge building on Asylum Avenue in Hartford, Connecticut, and they ended up downsizing to some space they rented in a warehouse somewhere. Uh, so it is what it is. I guess Spong's hope of catching the wave didn't work. They sure got the liberal. Catching went over him. <laughs> yeah. Wipeout. Wipeout it was. All right, I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 813 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>